Hello friends and welcome to For the Win Philly Season 2, presented by Temple University. I'm your host, Marissa Magnata, here with all of your esports and gaming information. We'll have weekly industry news, exclusive interviews, enriching stories, and we'll teach you a few things along the way. As you can see, things have changed just a tad bit since last season. Number one thing I'm most excited about is my brand new co-host. I would like to introduce you guys to Rosemary Kelly. You might know her by her gamer tag, Necra. Welcome to the show, Necra. Hey, Marissa. Thanks so much. Oh, please give us a rundown, a resume of everything that you've done so far in gaming. Why would we know you? Well, you might have seen me as a guest on For the Win Philly Season 1. But my background is actually in commentary and hosting for esports. I've covered a range of titles such as Overwatch, Hearthstone, Pokemon, and so much more. But enough about me. Let's just get right down to business. Anbox, known for fielding a team in the Overwatch League called the New York Excelsior, have now expanded into the Valorant scene. And this past weekend, they showed up in a big way. At the Nerd Street Gamers and Renegades Invitational, Anbox not only made their way through the qualifiers, but they also took home first place, taking home the lion's share of the $10,000 prize pool. Did I mention Overwatch already? Let's talk about Overwatch's biggest event of the year, the Grand Finals for the Overwatch League. This year, San Francisco Shock went undefeated, going 3-1 in the Grand Finals over the Philadelphia Fusion to win their second consecutive title in a row. As we enter into the postseason, we may see some roster changes come through, but for the San Francisco Shock, knowing how much success they've had, not one Pete, but two Pete, I don't think we're going to see too many changes from them. Another title in Blizzard's wheelhouse is StarCraft II, which, in an update on October 15th, has us questioning what the future of StarCraft II esports actually holds. Developers stated they're going to stop the support of in-game purchases like war chests, which historically have helped extend the prize pools for StarCraft II tournaments. What does this mean for the future of StarCraft II? Do we get a StarCraft III? While war chests for StarCraft II might not be a thing anymore, we still have the Dota 2 Battle Pass, which helps fund the international prize pool. Historically, Dota 2 has had some of the largest prize pools in the history of esports. But this year, Valve has outdone themselves. With $40 million on the line, this is the largest amount of money that has ever been on the table for a Dota 2 tournament or any esport tournament for that matter. Speaking of making some big moves, let's talk about Juju Smith-Schuster for a second. The wide receiver of the Pittsburgh Steelers is hoping to make some big waves in the gaming industry by launching new Team Diverge. Team Diverge hopes to be the linchpin of gaming entertainment and lifestyle, looking at athletes, musicians, and celebrities to take the helm for content creation for this new org. And finally, we have popular League of Legends streamer Tyler1 joining T1. So T1 plus T1 equals T2, or is it T squared? I'm not sure how the math pans out on that one, but what we do know is that this is a huge step for T1 to expand its roots into the United States as it's historically been a Korean esports organization. Celebrities entering into the gaming industry is nothing new. And for actor Asa Butterfield, this isn't their first rodeo. The actor known for roles in Hugo and Ender's Game is now on Team Liquid. Team Liquid is one of the world's leading and most famous esports organizations. Asa Butterfield is going to be working as a brand ambassador, most akin to their role last year with Panda Global. But we might also see Asa make some appearances on Team Liquid's Dota 2 and Smash teams. That's it for the esports headlines. Still to come, we've got Darf Mike bringing you the latest in gaming news on Field of View. Plus, we have a tutorial breaking down the basics of how to play the world's leading battle royale. Welcome to Field of View with Nerd Street Gamers, your weekly dose of gaming news. I'm Darf Mike coming to you live from the latest track in Mario Kart, your living room. And we've got a whole bunch of the track to race through this week, so let's hit the pedal to the metal and get to it. Mario Kart Live Home Circuit has released for the Nintendo Switch, and it's a game unlike any other. For the price of $99.99, you get a full Mario Kart, a physical RC car designed to look either like Mario or Luigi's Kart from the game that you can control with your Nintendo Switch. You can set up courses in the real world, designing them all around physical spaces, set up different gates as checkpoints for the course, and then race your kart 
from the comfort of your Switch around the floor. It's a pretty wild idea and a bit zany. And while it clocks in at a pretty high price point for a video game, it promises oodles of good time. Now, if you wanna get multiplayer, you're gonna need multiple additions as each cart requires its own Switch to control and each cart sells individually. So if you're trying to get big races going with multiple people, you could be running up a pretty hefty bill. But it may all be worth it. Now, it remains to be seen whether Nintendo is going to add a new edition where you can throw shells in real life or drop banana peels behind you, but I think modders are going to be able to figure that one out. Spooky season is upon us, folks, and what better way to get into the spirit than with a new horror game from Frictional Games. It's a new entry in the Amnesia series, this time titled Amnesia Rebirth, and it drops on October 20th. Now, the game puts you in the role of Tassi, a character who's traveling through colonial Africa sometime in the 1930s and gets stranded among all sorts of unforeseen horrors and monsters. And she fights to survive and find her partner amid a dark scenario that threatens to close in at any moment and consume her and her unborn child. It's a terrifying premise and apparently it'll shed an inward light on your deepest anxieties and fears as only frictional games seems to be able to do. But I'm personally not a big horror fan, so when it drops on October 20th, you can find me huddled up under the blankets with the lights on, rocking back and forth and talking to myself so the monsters can't get me. We've got a bit of breaking news about Insomniac's new Spider-Man game, Spider-Man Miles Morales, specifically about a costume slash feline companion you'll be able to unlock in the game. There's gonna be a mission in the game at some point where you have to rescue a bodega cat aptly named Spider-Man, that's right, you as Spider-Man have to rescue Spider-Man to become a spider duo. And after you rescue the cat, you're gonna be able to put him in your backpack and swing around the city as a terrible twosome, busting up crime, landing sick combos, and taking out unsuspecting thugs, all with the help of your feline companion as you keep the streets of Harlem safe, starting on November 12th when the game drops. In the annals of new ways to bleed money from players, NBA 2K has added a new page. They're adding full advertisements into the game that are completely unskippable. This is already the franchise that had casino elements and bled their players for microtransaction after microtransaction and have been talking about raising their game's price to $70 as opposed to the traditional 60, but they found a new way to make money. When you load into a game, there is an unskippable loading screen that plays you a full on ad. That's awesome. Oh, boogers. And it doesn't matter what system you have, PC won't save you. Faster loading times from an SSD make no difference as they will play that full advertisement regardless of your machine's ability to get you into the game itself. It's just one more page in ways to prick that extra bit of money from a player base that has no other option to go to because 2K has a complete monopoly on basketball games as a genre. It's a very anti-consumer policy, and if we don't stand up to this, if someone doesn't stand up to this, it's just gonna keep heading in a direction that nobody wants. Well, that's it for us this week on Field of View with Nerd Street Gamers, your weekly dose of gaming news. Now I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here and, uh... Well, that's a big dog. Thanks, Darth. There's no doubt the Field of View will keep us up to date with the latest gaming news right here on a weekly basis, and we're so excited. Uh, speaking of excited, that augmented reality Mario Kart game, I want to play, like, ASAP. Marissa, we have to. It's on like Donkey Kong. But one game that I don't think you can beat me at is Fortnite. And in this upcoming tutorial, we've got you covered on all the basics to get, help you get your first victory royale. Fortnite is currently one of the most popular video games in the world, and over the course of the last few years has created significant buzz with gamers and non-gamers alike. Its fun art style along with unique character models makes for an inviting, friendly experience. So let's teach you how to play. Fortnite Battle Royale is a free-to-play multiplayer game that pits 100 players against each other, where the last player standing wins. Within this mode, you can play both solo or on a team. Winning in any mode will grant you the glorious Victory Royale. Let's get started. In the beginning of the match, you'll spawn in a pregame area known as the lobby. This is where you and up to 99 other players will wait until the match begins. You might notice players with funny looking character models and weapons. These come from Fortnite's cosmetic system, which offers players a variety of visual options. Some cosmetics are unlocked for free, 
while others require a purchase. Cosmetics offer a unique way of distinguishing your character from others. Once the match begins, you and the other players will be teleported into the battle bus, which will take you soaring over the battlefield. Here's where the real fun begins. Open up your map using the prompt on the screen and choose where you want to land. Fortnite has a handy ping feature, which you can use to mark a spot on the map as a desired landing location. Once you've chosen a spot to land, go ahead and jump. Once you get close enough to the ground, your glider will automatically open, allowing you more control. Once you've hit the ground, get ready for the action. There are two main aspects of Fortnite Battle Royale, building and eliminating the other players. If you look in the first slot of your toolbar at the bottom of the screen, you'll see your trusty pickaxe. Its primary purpose is to gather resources by knocking down various objects throughout the map, such as walls, trees, cars, and more. Breaking objects turns them into building materials, which can then be used to build structures. The build controls can be found on your screen in the bottom right. Watch out though, everything you build can and will likely be destroyed. Whether you're building to hide, to reach places, or give yourself an edge, it's something you'll definitely want to practice. Oh, and one more tip, your pickaxe doubles as a weapon that you can swing at enemies. The main purpose of building in Fortnite is to assist you in eliminating the other players. In order to do so, you'll need to get some weapons. Throughout the map, you'll notice various items scattered across the ground, inside buildings, and sometimes even in objects. These items include medkits, shield potions, and weapons. Be sure to listen for glistening sounds. If you hear this sound, you're near a chest, which often has great loot. Weapons come in five different tiers. Common, Uncommon, Rare, Epic, and Legendary. These weapon tiers are distinguishable by their colors, with gray being common and orange being legendary. The higher the weapon tier, the more damage they deal. The predominant weapons that you'll end up using are a variety of pistols, assault rifles, submachine guns, snipers, and shotguns. Each weapon is useful in different situations. The more you play, the more experience you'll get with understanding what weapon works best in each situation. When playing in duos or squads, eliminating players is a bit more difficult. When you deal enough damage to another player, they'll go into a down state. If a player is down, their only action available is to crawl. This is actually a second chance for a player to get back into the game. If they can get close enough to a teammate, they can be revived and be thrown back into the action. The map in Fortnite is huge, so in order to keep games short, there's the Storm. The Storm is a big blue circle that progressively gets smaller as the game continues. If you stay outside of the circle, you'll be swallowed by the Storm and end up taking damage. To see where the circle is at all times, simply open up your map. Now that you know the basics, here's some strategies that we recommend trying. These strategies will have different benefits based upon the type of player that you are. If you're an aggressive player, we recommend Hot Dropping. Hot dropping means leaping out of the battle bus and landing in a highly congested area with other players. It's typically a strategy that will help you get used to combat with other players, further enhancing your combat skill. This scenario will grant you one of two outcomes. You'll either defeat your opponents and get full access to an abundance of materials early on, or you'll lose and be able to quit and start up a new game without wasting much time. Our next strategy is for more conservative players. We call this one riding the circle. This strategy involves dropping toward the outside of the map and picking a place with little to no action. As the circle closes, you simply move to the next safest place within the circle. The benefit of this strategy allows you to gather up as much loot as you can, gearing yourself up before reaching the final few circles. Regardless, strategies vary from player to player. There isn't a right or wrong way to play the game, so do what works best for your playstyle. Congratulations, you now know the basics of Fortnite. With this knowledge, you can begin your journey to the top, but it's up to you to start practicing. Don't expect to be amazing your first couple of games. There's a pretty good chance you're gonna get knocked out multiple times. But the more games you play, the better you'll get. Now go out there and get some victory royales. Okay, that Fortnite tutorial was super helpful. I was over here taking notes. I think I'm ready to play. Well, maybe I'm ready. Okay, Necker, can you just teach me a few more things and then I'll be ready to play? Here's what we're gonna do, Marissa. You and I are just gonna play together. Duo, drop hot, and I'm talking sweaty sands level of hot. Does that sound good? I, I don't know exactly what you just said, but it sounds awesome. Well, there's another game I really want to play with you, and it's called Sons of Ra. Inspired by Raiders of the Lost Ark, in this upcoming segment, we tell you all about it. Making a game starts with just a drawing. Then it becomes a 3D model. Then I go in and do the lighting for it. Then the player finally gets to see that model in an entirely new light. You're sitting there for thousands of hours working on something. You forget if it's fun. 
And when players come in and tell you that it is fun, that all that work you put in was worth it, that's the best feeling in the world. Sons of Ross started as a class project. We met during a class called Games Workshop 1. The class was split up into two different teams, and I was put on Jeff's team because he was pitching Sons of Ra. Sons of Ra. Sons of Ra. Sons of Ra. This Egyptian. Oh, it's a little bit of everything you have. Basically, a big, competitive, streamlined, non-linear strategy experience. Uh, Two-player tower defense game that can be played in single player. Like, you know, Steven Spielberg. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ancient Egyptian board game. Yeah, kind of. Sons of Ra is a competitive tower defense game. It is taking all of the best elements of tower defense games, RTS games, and auto battlers and throwing it all together into a new thing. The concept had to be inspired by a Steven Spielberg movie. And I'm not like a movie buff, but I've watched Raiders of the Lost Ark and they had the whole, you know, Egyptian sub theme with like the Temple of Ra and everything like that. And I sort of just use that as an excuse to bring in this topic that I'm actually kind of passionate about. When Jeff introduced the concept and he was like, we're doing Egypt and I based it off of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm like, I'm down, let's do this. I'm excited, I can't wait to work on it. Okay, uh, my name is Mark Hurley. I'm Joseph Brown. Michael Hefner. Uh, Jeff Mostyn. Mark is our lead artist. I do 3D art, animation textures, all of the units in the game, most of the animations, pretty much everything that is visible in the game. Joe, coming up with out there ideas. Also business development, marketing, design. So it's all the uh, fun art stuff that isn't actually going into the game. We have two really strong programmers, Jeff taking on the role of like, everything that like mounts up. He worries a little too much, but that's good <laughs> because he's overly worried, but it also means he catches things that we otherwise would have missed. He's such a hard worker. It's honestly, so I'm like, man, this guy is working tirelessly on this. I'm like, can't be the subpar programmer. So, you know, I got, I got to also like really try hard at it. Michael, also a really good programmer. I think he also keeps us a bit more grounded. He's like the chill person on the team. <laughs> So that's probably the most important thing. I mean, making sure that everything runs properly and doesn't break, which happens all the time. <laughs> Everyone says like, oh, I couldn't have done it without them, but like th we would not be in the same place we are if the four of us weren't on this together. At the very beginning, it was very simple, not very pretty. Originally it was going to appear visually more like a true strategy game with like fully animated units that like are actually like soldiers, you know, running across the fields. And uh, Mark came up to me after class early on in the project and he basically said, okay, Jeff, um, we can have fully animated units or we can have a completed game. And it was initially just the soldiers jumping around, but then we turned it into a Sinet board, which is an ancient Egyptian game, and it gave us a much different aesthetic than a lot of similar games have. I wasn't big on Egyptian mythology, so everything I had to do for the artwork in the game was research I had to do now. So you wanna head on into the Egyptian galleries and take a look at what we have? Absolutely. Okay, so here's a really interesting piece uh, you guys might be interested in. Uh, your game certainly features uh, an interesting side of Egypt, uh, which is warfare and conflict. I got a bunch of like reference images that have been really helpful for like how the stone was like cracking and breaking. These are some of our very original unit designs, which mm -hmm. try to draw from what Egyptian soldiers might have worn. You know, they wouldn't be wearing like full plate. Yeah, I think they were light and meant for easy wielding in combat. Uh, the chepesh was meant yeah. for, you know, really kind of rapid striking. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, with the uh, upper mm -hmm. crown being white and the lower being red, mm -hmm. uh, we also incorporated those okay. colors of our design. I approached people on the team and asked them if they would be interested in continuing to work on the project after the class was over with the intent to release it so we could have something on our resume as a fully developed game. First it was just, uh, let's make a resume piece. It wasn't meant to be much, it was meant to be about six months of work, giving us experience how to make something from scratch all the way to the end. And then it was like, hey, we're taking this to shows and it's looking really good and people keep telling us, you, this isn't a student game, this is a real game and you need to work on it. We figured, hey, you know, maybe it'll make us 
$50 and it'll be cool. I think the big turning point came when we were offered by our mentor to go to E3. We were like right there next to the giant Nintendo booth and like we we're like sitting there with our little, little student game. And then we ended up winning that prize and it was just, okay, so uh, I guess we gotta give this some time now. <laughs> The first four months, I think, four, maybe five, maybe six, was just cleansing the corruption of a college project. We can't build off of this. This is so broken. We need to go back and we need to do this again. We need to do this again. We need to do this again. From there, we just kept expanding the game and trying to figure out what a commercial version of Sons of Raw would be. Like, okay, are we gonna have online multiplayer? Are we gonna have a single player mode? And so that's where we started really expanding and making radical changes. So fonts are gonna be a little bit tricky. Being an independent game developer, it's not easy. Setting up a company and effectively publishing a game ourselves is a lot of work. There are so many games released on Steam every single day. Like if you don't know how to market, your game's just gone. It doesn't matter how good it is, it will just get buried. So we had to sort of learn that as we go, like, okay, let's create a Twitter account and start posting stuff there. Let's go to these events so that we can actually talk to people and get them interested in our game. We're planning to release in early 2021. Release date. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it actually releasing and people being able to get it on their hands. The game hasn't even released yet and we already have a small community and they're like, oh man, I can't wait until it comes out. I can't wait until this. It's definitely the most exciting work I've ever done in my life. Sons of Ra is a new game uh, with a new concept that isn't based off of anything else and doesn't play like anything else. It's fast paced, but still casual. It has this wonderful charm to it that I think the community is entirely responsible for and we just helped bring that vision to life. Sons of Ra is so inspiring. Seeing that it was a student-led project turned full-fledged video game with just a little bit of encouragement. And it's a game that you can buy in early 2021 on Steam. Exactly, and it was made right here in our backyard. Anything local, anything made in Philly, I just love that. I love that too. And something else that I thought was super helpful was that Fortnite tutorial that taught you the basics on how to play Fortnite. I feel like I learned a lot and studying the basics is a great way to get good at the game. Don't forget, you have a lot to teach me still too. But how did you enjoy your first episode of FTW Philly? I had such a blast, Marissa. And don't worry, I'm not letting you off the hook that easily for our Mario Kart race. Good. Well, for Necra and the entire team of FTW Philly presented by Temple University, GG's and we'll see you next time.